truly adept and worshipful William Richards will give a wonderful presentation about Chief Master Sawyer. Well, thank you, Grant Hall. Uh, relax, everybody. <clears throat> and hopefully this will work. <laughs> um, I, I really like Brother Charlie's suggestion to call his potential new forest the Lost Cities. <laughs> um, because it, there's an interesting history there, some great stories. And it, the forest itself tells a story based on just its name. So, brethren, the, the key question that I had was, who is Massasoit and why are we named after him? And, you know, we are Massasoit Forest 91. We're named after the Sakam of the Wampanoag tribe in uh, southeastern Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, we all know that he helped the pilgrims. He uh, was very... You know, without his assistance, that the uh, Plymouth Colony probably would not have survived. Uh, but all we really know are the stories that were recorded by the English. Um, there's not much that we have beyond what they say. So I want to kind of take a look at the world where he lived in. And, uh, and that might give us an indication of just who he was as a person. And uh, hence, we're going to look at the life and times of Usamaquin which that was his given name. Uh, Massasoit may have been a ceremonial name given him when be, he became the Sakam, uh, or it might've been a title. Uh, that has never been clear in any of the sources that I've looked at. What we're looking at here is the Northeast portion of North America, including uh, you know, the East coast of, Mass of the United States and of Canada. And where we're gonna look first is off to the west of New England, where the Haudenosaunee were. We now know them as the Iroquois Confederation. Uh, Iroquois, which may actually be a pejorative term, was coined to them uh, from another tribe when they asked who are these people. And basically the, the tribe that they asked pointed and said, those people over there, and the word, one of the words they used was Iroquois, and it was the French that basically uh, set that name. But uh, we, so we now know them in modern times as the Iroquois Confederacy. One of the interesting things about the, the Haudenosaunee is that they formed a unique form of government. Uh, it was brought together by one individual who is known as the great peace giver, keeper, or bring, excuse me, peace bringer. And he had all the major tribes send a representative and all the tribes would basically, the representatives would get together, discuss any differences, any problems. And when they came together as a consensus with a solution, all would go by that consensus. Uh, what's important about this is this is what the United States government is based on, the House of Representatives. 100% based on how the Iroquois Confederacy worked. This worked so well for a number of centuries, they became so powerful that where while all the different uh, tribes in the regions around them were basically uh, having issues and disintegrating, they were growing and becoming more powerful to the point when the colonists began from Europe began entering North America. Um, they were so powerful that the colonists had to deal with them on a one-to-one -one basis. What finally brought them down was during the American Revolution, they sided with the English because they felt it was honorable to stick with the contract, the agreements that they had uh, joined up with the English. Um, and when the English lost the war, the Iroquois basically lost everything. To the Northwest were the Wabanaki, confederacy uh we know the abenaki they were the tribe that lived in uh, maine well they were part of the algonquins the algonquin people predominantly were the northeast north american continent whereas the um Haudenosaunee were the iroquois people they, their language there were two languages here algonquin and iroquois and that's what separated the groups the wabenaki were almost as powerful as the iroquois and as you can see, their territories butted up against each other. 
And as the Iroquois became more and more powerful, they began to uh, move into the New England area. The Wabanaki, while not quite as powerful as the Iroquois, had a higher population. And as such, they were able to uh, keep them off for some time. But as you can see, there was a small finger that was just starting to grow into New England. That was where they were beginning to take over the Southern New England. Had the European colonists never entered into North America, it is very likely that this would have become an Iroquois nation over time. Between them in Southern New England were the Southern Algonquins, Algonquians, and they are the people who we're going to be looking at. And that will be the tribes that made up the Southern New England area of which the Wampanoag Confederation was one of which. Uh, the Wampanoags were bordered by the Narragansett and the Massachusetts tribes. Uh, both of these tribes were fairly aggressive and they were constantly at odds with the Wampanoags and trying to take over territory with them. Uh, to the west of the Narragansett, we see the Pequot and the Mohegan tribes. The Mohegans had actually been in Western Massachusetts, but they had been forced out by Mohawk members of the Iroquois Confederacy um, as they were beginning to spread into the New England area. The, uh, the Pawgusset tribe was also fairly aggressive and they were able to hold their own against the, uh, the Iroquois incursions into Southern New England but they were beginning to fade out as uh, this process went on. Now, Wampanoag was actually a term that the English applied to the tribes of Southeastern Massachusetts. Their language was the Wampanoag language, but we know them as a Wamp the name word Wampanoag was a portamento of this and the Wampanoos, which is a word that was used by another tribe to describe the people that lived here. And they referred to them as the people in the East or the people of the dawn. Hence, these two words combined, the English began to call them the Wampanoag. Um, and these included uh, the, uh, the Mashpee, the Akushnet, uh, Aquidnet, Sakonet tribes, Seekonk, Asinet, Kohanet, and so on. Now you notice up by Plymouth, you see uh, there is one tribal name called Patuxet, and yet that name is grayed out, and we'll discuss that in a little while. Now, in 1605, there was uh, a raid on Massachusetts. However, we found that there, the records for this were unable to be supported. Uh, however, in 1614, you'll have to excuse the date I put in there, 1605, um, Thomas Hunt was a captain along with an expedition from England. And uh, he was left behind briefly that he was going to load up a ship with uh, fish and a few other provisions before leaving New England. And he sailed to a village called Patuxet, where he convinced 20 men from that village to board his ship with a promise that they were going to do trade. And once he had them on the ship, he raised anchor and sailed away with them on board and headed for um, Europe, basically tricking them. Uh, and he sailed with them over across the sea where he sold them into slavery in Spain. Tisquantum was one of these men and he was rescued by, among with a few others by Spanish monks. And they hoped to educate him and then through enlightening his mind, convert him to Christianity. Well, during this period, um, he left the Spanish monastery and made his way to England. And while he was in England, he learned English and he moved to the Cornhill section of London where he lived for a number of years uh, until he met Pocahontas who had been brought over by John Smith. Uh, John Smith having been on the previous section, Hunt had abducted those men. Now there is a footnote to this is Smith and the other people who led that expedition were so disgusted with Hunt for what he had done. Um, they basically fired him and he was never hired by any other group or organization in Europe to return to North America. So he never returned to North America. Um, 
to Squantum while he was there, he lived with John Slaney, who was a shipbuilder and merchant. And Slaney, having gotten to know to Squantum, decided he wanted to try his luck with the new world and trying some trade there. And he had to Squantum left for a colony that was in Newfoundland. While they were there, Tisquanta befriended one of the colonists named Thomas Dermer, and he convinced him that because he lived in the southern portions of New England, that if they went there, he might be able to uh, mediate between the two, uh, Dermer and the tribes there, and uh, open up some trade. So they sailed off in 1619, and thus, after about five or six years, Tisquanta was finally able to return to his home. But there's a caveat to this. This brings us into the territory of Massasoit. His given name was Usamaquin. Uh, and as I said earlier, Massasoit may have been a title or ceremonial name given him when he became Stockham. Uh, among many of the Native American tribes, uh, when a child was born, they were given a name. And then when they came of age, they were given a new name to replace their childhood name. So during each stage of their life, through childhood, manhood, and so on, they would receive a new name by which they identified themselves. So he has two names. Usamaquin, I believe, was probably his given name. And as I said before, I believe Massasoit was either the name he was awarded upon, upon becoming Sakam, or uh, it was a title that went along with it. He was born in 1581. And by the time the pilgrims arrived, he was in his, in his 40s. And he would eventually die in 1661 at the age of 80 years. So he did quite well. So it's estimated that he may have been in his late 20s or early 30s when he was elected by the women elders of the Wopanawa Confederacy to be the Sakam. Now, the women who were the elders basically owned the property. They ran the villages, uh, and any property or belongings were passed down through the women. The men basically tended to uh, hunting or uh, defending the tribes or warring upon other tribes and working the politics between the different villages. The women who chose who would be the Sakam. And Sakam was the great chief. It wasn't just that he was chief of his tribe. He was Sakam of the entire confederacy of the Wampanoag. And he was chosen by all the women of the entire confederacy. So he was well known. He was well accomplished. Um, and the fact that he was selected so young says something about his capability uh, to be considered the leader of their group. Now, as I said before, there was friction between the Narragansett, the Massachusett, and the Wakanoad tribes. And Massasoit was considered a man of peace. He tried to avoid violence and bloodshed at every possible turn. Uh, he relied on diplomacy and sometimes on playing one against the other in order to avoid any warfare between the tribes. And considering what was going on around them at the time, the pressure from the Iroquois to the West, forcing the tribes running to the East, um, the, the friction between uh, the Iroquois and uh, the Algonquins to the North. And he was able to keep the Wampanoag tribes fairly safe through this whole process, through his entire lifetime, says a great deal about what he was able to accomplish. And the fact that they were willing to listen to him when he wanted to talk peacefully and diplomatically says something about his capability as a warrior, which goes back to when the women selected him to become Sakim. One of the qualifications was you had to be a very good warrior, very strong warrior. And that says something about him as a person. And this brings us to what else was going on during this period. Um, there was a massive epidemic that wiped out 
a huge number of the people living along the East Coast and the Northeast. And the uh, Native Americans in this area referred to that as the Great Dying. And a lot of people assumed it was smallpox. But there's now new evidence that shows that they strongly believe this was leptospirosis, which is a blood pathogen, a blood disease. It was known to Europeans as a seven-day fever, and it was most often always f fatal. This epidemic wiped out 90% of the Algonquian population from the Wabanaki Confederacy down through the Wapanoags. And the only way I can describe this is with the current time with us under this pandemic, if you drove up to Boston, perhaps at maybe five o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, and you notice how there's no traffic compared to maybe Friday driving home during the middle of rush hour, this should give you an idea of what it's like to lose 90% of the living population. And that's what happened to the Native Americans in this region. When Tusquantum sailed south with his friend from the, uh, from the Newfoundland colony, they sailed to Patuxet. And when they arrived, his entire village was wiped out. He was a sole survivor of his people. And this is why in 1619, they just could not have timed that worse. He had nowhere else to turn. So Tusquantum made his way to uh, the Poconoket village and that's Massasoit's village where he presided. By 1620, with so many people dead from the epidemic, uh, the Narragansetts began to really press on the Wampanoags. And at the same time, that's when the pilgrims landed in Plymouth. Now, we have to consider who the pilgrims were when they came here. Um, we talk about them as being the founding fathers of our country. As a child, I learned that when they arrived in North America, it was virgin wilderness. There was nobody here, and they just took it over. The, the truth could not have been further from uh, what we were told. The pilgrims were basically the Al-Qaeda of their day. Um, they tried to blow up the parliament in England. They actually overthrew temporarily the... Uh, the monarchy of England. They were thrown out of every country in Europe. Nobody wanted them. And finally, to get away from all this persecution, um, they offered they would leave Europe and head for the new world, which <laughs> the uh, old world was more than happy to see them go. When they arrived in Massachusetts, which was not where they were supposed to be, what they found were abandoned habitations and the skeletons of the people who had died laying all around. And instead of mourning all these deaths, what had happened to all these people, they thanked God and said, look at that, you cleared out all these primitive vermin, and you left all these empty villages for us to occupy and these fresh fields ready to farm. And that's who the pilgrims were. Massasoit, now during all this period, a lot of, again, history tells us the pilgrims were the first to land, but they were not. For the previous century, uh, the French had been hunting furs up in Canada. The Portuguese were fishing right off the coast of Massachusetts. Uh, the Native Americans had an enormous amount of contact with the European people. And that's where the epidemic started from. They basically brought it here. It was, there were a number of epidemics that hit the Native Americans here, but it was that uh, the seven day fever that really did them in. So when the pilgrims arrived, the people, the different, uh, villages around ran to um, Massasoit and let him know what had happened. He sent a warrior named Samoset to greet them. And uh, now they knew about the Native Americans and they knew what to expect, particularly that uh, because an English captain a number of years before had slaughtered a number of warriors, um, the rather than being friendly, now the Native Americans are being very uh, antagonistic towards anyone showing up on the shores. So Massasoit said Samoset, and instead of uh, being threatened, Samoset walked into the village and asked them for some beer. For Samoset, had had a similar experience to Tisquantum. Uh, he had been captured by the English, uh, brought into slavery, but was later 
released and came back. So he knew a little bit of English, but he had not been in with, among the English long enough to really have a good command of the language. However, to Squantum, who had been living in the village, uh, he knew a number of languages. He was well-educated, potentially better educated than a lot of the colonists. And uh, he came with Samoset at a later visitation and was far better able to communicate with, uh, with the, plant, with the uh, pilgrims. Uh, he taught them how to plant uh, food, how to uh, fertilize the ground and help them survive. But as they had a lot of problems pronouncing to Squantum's name, they began to call him Squanto. So if you've ever wondered where that name Squanto came from, that was it. Now, Massasoit saw the colonists as an advantage to him. And by using diplomacy and helping them, he uh, was able to ally with them and help him repel the Narragansetts and keep them from attacking the Wapanoags, who had been so devastated by disease. And he was able to keep this up throughout his entire life, up until 1661 when he died. Uh, unfortunately, he was pretty much the only force that kept the peace going between all these groups. And when he died, um, everything fell apart very quickly. Uh, his eldest son, Wam Sutta, had been appointed in his place to be uh, the new Sakam of the Wapanoak. However, uh, he was apparent, uh, it's believed he was poisoned by the, uh, the Plymouth colony, uh, and he died within a year, which resulted in his younger brother, uh, who was named Philip, taking uh, up the uh, leadership. And Philip began King Philip's War, which resulted in a massive, massive uh, massacre on both sides, uh, primarily for the Native Americans. In the end, uh, because of that war, most of the men from the Wapanoags were sold off into slavery by uh, down in the colonies in the Bahamas and the Caribbean. And the women and children were kept as slaves among the uh, whites that uh, then in the now growing English colony in Massachusetts. So Massasoit left quite a powerful legacy uh, as who he was. And uh, the fact that he was able to maintain peace for almost 50 years between all these people really says something about who he was. And it's something that you should reflect on when we consider that we have taken his name for our forest. So thank you very much.